In the Global Scholars Program, our first unit was focused on what does it mean to be globally competent and why is it important? And we wanted to find a person with real life experience who could share their story with the uh, students so they could understand sort of the magnitude of this way of thinking and how it might influence your life. And so we came across Sebastian who had uh, calls himself a third culture kid because he grew up all over the world. And he really felt that that experience uh, set him up to have a certain way of looking at the world uh, that's contributed to his success as a professional basketball player, as a businessman, but he really attributes it as one of the reasons why he survived this terrorist attack. And so we knew the students could relate to Sebastian. We knew he would uh, convey a story that would amaze them and make them think and think about themselves in a way what would they do in a similar situation and how did the skills of global competency um, aid them in their current life and in their future life as well. Good morning. Thank you very much uh, for having me. Um, I'm here today to share with you uh, a story. Okay, it's, uh, it's not the easiest story as you'll see. It's, it's actually a nightmare. Um, but in this nightmare, there are a lot of great lessons. Um, there's a positive message at the end of this nightmare, and um, I think you'll uh, I think you'll see and enjoy um, this presentation. Well, at least I hope so. <laughs> um, let me introduce the main character of this story. That that's me. Uh, I apologize if you were waiting for somebody else, but I'm the main character. Um, just to uh, a quick introduction about my background, I was um, born in Brazil a while back. And I have uh, two brothers, and I had later two stepbrothers as well. So we were five boys growing up. And I'm a TCK, which is a third culture kid. I moved around a great deal. I was born in Brazil, lived in Indianapolis, Philadelphia, Denmark, Italy, Belgium, New York, Michigan, Italy. I, I, traveling was my thing. And this gave me a really unique perspective on life. It gave me the ability to see the contrast the world has to offer. In every single place I went, I was able to have not only the examples of the positives that each place has to offer, but I, I, it allowed me to adapt it to my life. And so for, after moving around, um, I graduated from the International School of Brussels. I did the full IB program. And I got a scholarship to play basketball at uh, Marist College in New York. And I transferred from Marist um, after a few uh, shaky years and results. I transferred to another D1 school in Oakland University. And I played uh, at Oakland for two years. We won the Horizon League Championship. And I got a, um, after leaving there, I played professional basketball for 15 years. So that's, that's me. I look a lot more fearful than I am in those pictures. I'm a big teddy bear off the court, though, so don't get mistaken. And I played for 15 years. I played in Italy. I played in, uh, in Belgium. And uh, after 15 years, I retired, and I started a little uh, company with two buddies of mine. We invented the world's first, sorry, I didn't, I'm not that smart. I didn't invent it. We marketed the world's first video production system, automated, so we can live stream a sports event, mostly basketball, 100% automatically. There's no operator, there's no cameraman, everything is multi, um, there's multi functions to it, but 100% automated. And we sold this company in 2015 to uh, a big group of investors here in New York. And I started traveling from our, new, from our Brussels offices to New York um, very, very frequently. And the story picks up on March 22nd, 2016, um, when I'm about to board a flight from Brussels to go back to New York, okay? So there's a quick video I want to show you, and then the good part starts. From the explosion to when you come to your senses again, those two, three seconds is is unreal. 
It's hell. You hear screams. That's an arm. That's a leg. You can see that. I mean, the this, this smell oh, is disgusting. As 38-year-old Sebastian Bellin lay gravely injured, these images of him were already circulating on the internet, becoming symbols of the Brussels airport terrorist attack. You feel death creeping on you. From knee down, you don't feel anything anymore. And then it goes up to your thighs. And you're thinking, OK, this is going up. But if it hits my heart, I'm done. 4,000 miles away, at Bellin's home in Battle Creek, Michigan, his wife Sarah had just woken up when she received a text from a friend. We're thinking of you, we're here for you, Sarah. We love you. And I thought, that's a strange message. But then I saw the photo. I screamed, I woke the girls up from my screaming. It was panic and terror, and I saw that he was trying to look up as the former college and pro basketball player lay bleeding. News organizations reported that the deadly blasts were coordinated suicide bombings at Brussels Airport and a train station. ISIS later claimed responsibility. They had put bullets into the bomb. and I'd gotten shot via the bomb into my hip. My hip was just sticking out. You know, I just had like bones and flesh. I strained out my knee, but my foot stayed on the other side, on the ground. I was really concerned about losing my leg. It wasn't detached, but I thought it was at first because I couldn't feel anything. That's when somebody came and pulled me away from that spot to behind some pillars where that photo was taken. So when he pulled me, I was actually hanging onto my leg, feeling like I didn't want to lose it. What I realized is that there was people coming to help and then leaving because everyone thought there was going to be a third explosion. My game plan was every time they come back, tell them what you want them to do. Bellin was rapidly losing blood. He desperately needed medical help, but he couldn't move. When your blood pressure goes down, you start sweating. And I, I was sweating nonstop. So I knew that you know time was clicking. And so I just kind of bullied my way <laughs> to say, no, I'm out of here. You know, and I was, I was threatening people. I was like, if I stay here and I die, it's on your conscience. In order to survive, Bellin says he had to be mobile. He convinced a young airport worker to help his six foot nine frame onto a luggage cart and move him to the front of the terminal. Like in a game, you know, you're down. How are you going to get up to that, tw that 20 point gap where well, you got to find ways to chip away at it? And I was chipping away. Everything I could use, I was chipping away at, at overcoming the situation that Everything around me told me, yeah, this, you're not going to make it. Bellin had lost 50% of his blood and was rushed to the hospital and taken into surgery. Four days later, his wife Sarah arrived in Brussels. I couldn't wait to get in there and put my arms around him and hug him and just hold him, happy that he was alive, that he made it. On May 1st, Bellin was reunited with daughters Cecilia and Vanessa. You want to shield them from the reality, you know, you want your kids to stay innocent and be able to grow without the worries that sometimes we face. In these circumstances, it's very hard, you know, to keep that reality from them. Okay, not too much weight on that right leg. After six surgeries and three months in the hospital, Bellin returned to the United States on June 9th. Therapists at University Hospital at the University of Michigan are helping him learn to walk again. Okay. I was 50 yards, not even away from a major bomb blast that took out, you know, half of an airport. And yet I still have my both my legs. So I choose to look at it as, you know, they're not looking too good, <laughs> but they're pretty strong legs. My tibia was multi-fragmented. So basically it means the, the bone blew up. <laughs> they drilled a nail into my tibia. So they had to put a pin into my femur and reconnect it with a nail to my, to my hip socket. There was no fracture here, it was just a hole straight to the bone. They took skin from here and closed the two major wounds. Huh. Bellin played basketball at Marist College and Oakland University. Like the, the Hoosier gym. <laughs> yeah. Then overseas as a pro for 15 years. A few, few practice shots? Yeah, sure. I owe so much to basketball. It's given me a skill set 
to be able to survive, you know, a terrorist attack because I, I really did use a lot of the things that I learned in basketball or my athletic side to survive it. Like what? Not panicking, you know, staying calm under pressure. That competitive nature wanted me to beat the situation. <laughs> Bellin says it was his daughters who gave him the will to survive. How are the girls doing? They're doing great. Yeah. They're so happy that he's back here. But it was hard for them, especially our youngest. She would cry for him every night. I know you're playing. They were my motivation. And to be able to overcome that, you need some motivation behind that. And um, just, just thinking about that moment, it's, it, it's tough. Look at mama. I owe a lot to them because it's your kids. You know, you don't want them to grow up without a dad. It's, um, I, without them knowing, I owe, I owe them a lot. All right, so I told you it was a nightmare, right? Not the, not the easiest message, um, images to, uh, to see and definitely not the easiest to, to experience. You know, I, um, I've had 10 surgeries since there, um, since, since that moment. Uh, it's been a tough road. It's been a tough road. It's been one that uh, is filled with, um, with, of course, a lot of blocking points a lot of uh, situations where, honestly, it didn't look like I was ever gonna walk again, where I was gonna be amputated with this leg. But um, I overcame them all. And little by little, I rebuilt my life. And when life throws you kind of a second chance to rebuild yourself, well, there's certain things along the way that I've used. My unique perspective from living all over the world, my professional um, basketball career, the athletic side that's been so important to me. And there's really four themes, I think, that I've learned along the way that I think is applicable to many situations. The first of these themes is team. Now, you're going to roll your eyes on me, and you're going to be like, okay, well, we've heard this before, right? The team. There's no I in team. i gotta, I got to build a team around myself. But it's really the first theme and the major point in overcoming a situation. That's, that's what I think. And from bouncing back from such a uh, terrible situation, I built myself a team. You know, when I, when I grew up, my dad used to tell me one thing. He used to tell me, Seb, if you're the smartest guy in the room, you're in the wrong room. There's no use in being in a room where the smartest, you're not going to get anything out of it. Surround yourself with people that can motivate you, that can teach you something. And how many of us today surround ourselves with people that really motivate, that really inspire us, that teach us? Don't only be a student, be a teacher. And so one of the first things I did after the attacks, when I was, I was three months in a hospital bed, I couldn't move, was I started creating my team. And who are these guys? These guys are my two surgeons. And they became very, very close friends. Does anybody know how long it takes to become an orthopedic surgeon? To be an orthopedic surgeon, it takes 14 years. And the man on the left is Professor Kulalis. Professor Kulalis is from Greek. They're actually, they're both Greek. And they, they, they would argue all the time, sometimes even during surgery, they would argue. Like, you guys sure you shouldn't, shouldn't have knocked this out before? but they're phenomenal people. And one of the big things about Professor Kulalis is he's one of the inventors of the external fixator. So my leg was in such shambles after the attack that they needed to put an external fixator. So it's like a big metal bar that they put on your leg to kind of merge the bones together because they can't operate it until the, 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 the bone, because it was an exploded, the bones exploded until they kind of merged together. And he had absolutely the amazing thing about this guy, even though he invented the external fixator, he had absolutely no ego. This was one of the most humble individuals in the world. And I think that when you're humble, I think that when you have a lot of humility, it att you attract a lot of opportunities. Because there is nothing more, in my opinion, um, humbling 
than saying, okay, I've reached the maximum. I've invented a surgical procedure, and yet I'll listen. And so actually, Teo, it was in year 13. So he, he actually wasn't even a surgeon yet. But Kulalis listened. And so we, I created a team. And this team, we decided, to, okay, some very, I'll say it, dangerous operations. Because I had two such big wounds in my legs that any time you put metal into your legs and there's been an open wound, the chances of a bacterial infection is very, very high. So a lot of times they don't, they don't, they don't operate until months and months and months ahead of time. And Teo, we came up with a good plan. Say, no, we're going to do it. And they told me after I wouldn't walk for a year and a half. Well, at first, they said that they would have to amputate this leg. And with a team around me, with the humility of everybody around us, we started creating a game plan. And this game plan, little by little, merged into a success plan. And so from being told that I might have an op, uh, amputation, from being told I wouldn't walk again for a year and a half, I'd be in a wheelchair for most of that time, I walked after four months. The attacks happened on March 22nd. My eldest daughter's birthday is June 22nd. And for her birthday present, I walked. She came down the stairs. I was sitting at a table. And I got up and I went to say her. I went to see her and I said, happy birthday. We all need motivation. But without a good team to help you put this motivation to work, you limit, your, you limit yourself. So once we create that team, once we create that that game plan, and someone to implement that game plan with. What's the second theme? The second theme is fear, okay? I think that fear is an illusion. So the fear, let me just, this picture here, this is the arena where I won a lot of championships. I was the captain of this team for five years. We won championships, huge success. And the fear of not being able to play, to walk, Well, I discovered very quickly that the fear is an illusion, like I said. Why is fear an illusion? Because you see, there's a big danger, there's a big difference between danger and fear. I'll give you a quick example. A car coming at you full speed, that's dangerous. Get out of the way. You're going to get hit by a car. Fear is getting up in the morning thinking, I'm going to get hit by a car. There's a big difference between the both. You see, the only place fear can exist is in your mind. Fear is an emotion that rises, but that you control. And so how many of us today live with that illusion in our minds? As parents, we see parents educating their kids or raising their kids with that fear. Oh, I don't want them to do that because this could happen. You see kids. Sorry, calling you kids. You see young adults about to take a test. Oh, I'm, I'm going to fail this test. I'm going to bomb it. Maybe that's not a good word to choose in the circumstances. I'm going to fail it. But on the other hand, you haven't even taken that test. And you're already, that illusion is working. And so that, that illusion, that fear becomes more and more of a handicap. You have power over fear. It is an absolutely an illusion, but yet you allow it to exist by spreading in your mind. And that fear then inhibits the third theme, which is focus. Focus is so important. Because you see, when you have a lot of fear, you don't see the opportunities that life puts before you. So let me give you an example. During the attacks, there was a dead woman that was right next to me during the, after the attacks, seconds after. And I saw the panic of other people, of other survivors around me. But at that very moment, I wasn't dying. I had survived. And so that little change of perspective allowed me to have a completely new mindset in that circumstance. Feared had no control over me. 
at that very moment, I was living. I had survived. And so I started seeing opportunities around me. The scarf that you see in the picture, the scarf became a tourniquet. So, to, you know, everyone know what a tourniquet is? To stop the flow of blood in your leg. A suitcase to my left became a way for me to elevate my legs to stop the flow of blood. A baggage cart in the distance became a way for me to be mobile again. They lifted me onto the baggage cart so that I could be mobile. And so all these things that life puts in front of us, we all have opportunities. But how many of those opportunities do we really see or we go by because we don't have that focus? Because that fear, anxiety, stress, they're the overlaying, they're the powerful features in our mind that we're focusing on. And so we rid ourselves of this illusion, we have a clear focus and we start seeing opportunities. But what are we going to focus on? We're going to focus on, I think, the fourth theme, which is the quality versus the quantity. See, I think we live in a society, I think we live in a world which focuses more and more on quantity. There are so many examples that we see where the focus and the respect is all about quantity. And there's a big difference between both. See, your quantity is your wants. Everybody wants to be a champion. Everybody wants to do well. But what do you need to be a champion? What do you need to do well? And your, your needs is the quality in your life. Let me give you a quick example. When you're really, really thirsty, when you're really thirsty, do you think oh, I need four glasses of water. No, you just think, I need water. Your needs are not, you're not able to quantify needs. However, your wants are very easy to quantify. And if you focus on your wants and you focus on quantity, you never have enough. I love this image that I use a lot. We, we, we all pack bags. In the morning, you pack your backpack. When you go on trips, you pack your, your bags. And you see, you see people going through life with luggage. We all have luggage. We're, we're all carrying luggage with us. And you see people walking in life or going through, going through life with this baggage. And those who pack and focus on quantity their luggage becomes extremely heavy. You see them. Imagine going through life after having a, a, a life full, filled with so much focus on quantity. Well, those bags get heavy. And so you see those people going through life like, like the whole weight of the world is on their shoulders. And more and more, you see these people every day. They're angry. They're anxious because it's heavy. On the other hand, you see those people that are packing their bags, that are focusing on the quality. How much does love weigh? How much does affection, tolerance, an open mind, how much does that weigh? Doesn't weigh anything. And so you see these people zooming by you. You're like, well, uh, that guy's so lucky. How come, how come life is so easy to that person? How come they're zooming ahead of me? And the more you find that person, find out about that person, the more you see that they're really their focus and they have so much quality in their lives. So the more we focus on the quality, the more we add resources and opportunities in our life. And I'll finish with this one story. That's a true story. It happened the night before the attacks. And I think you understand the moral behind the story. The night before the attacks, I was in Paris all day. And we had, I just signed a huge contract for the little company that we started, Key Motion. It's called, the company was called Key Motion. We assigned a four-year deal with the French Basketball League. So we were going to put a Key Motion system in every single professional gym in France. 
It was an 820,000 euro contract for four years. That's big, those are big numbers for a little company. We had made it. So the quantity wise, I mean, that was, that's not a bad day's work. And I took the late train from Paris to back to Brussels. I get off the train in Brussels and I get a call from my friend, a buddy of mine. He goes, hey, listen, I, I know you're leaving tomorrow. Um, why don't you come to dinner with us? His, his wife teaches with my wife at the International School of Brussels. I said, no, no, you know, I've, I've, I've been, uh, I haven't eaten anything all day. I'm really tired. I just want to, I just want to go home and I'm going to sleep. I'm, le I'm leaving really early tomorrow morning. And I hung up on him. He calls me back. He goes, listen, just come for an hour. I'm like, no, listen, I I'm going to be terrible company. I'm tired. I just want to go to sleep. I hung up on him second time. He calls me back a third time. It's like, listen, you got to eat. You know, I know you. I know how much you like to eat. You come out with us for an hour. I said, no, I really, I don't want to go. And I hung up on it. Calls me back a fourth time. So listen, come on, man. I love you. I haven't seen you in a long time. I know you're going back to the States tomorrow. You know, just come out for an hour. Just eat something, then go home. I said, all right, fine. I'm coming out. So we go to this little Italian restaurant. And I know the owner. It's my favorite place. I know the owner very well. He's Italian. His wife is Spanish. And they, they sit in the back of the kitchen all day long, and they argue about how much spice they should put in this and that. It's an amazing little place. And I ordered my favorite dish, which is pasta carbonara. And he brings out the pasta carbonara. And I scoff it down in like two minutes. By the time he came out with the other dishes, my, my serving of pasta carbonara was already gone. And he looks at the plate, and he's like, listen, that's, that's, that wasn't enough. I said, look, your, your quality is amazing, but your quantity needs some serious work. Look at me. And he gets offended, and he goes into the kitchen and makes me a double portion of pasta carbon. I mean, huge. And I wolf the whole thing down. And the next day, I go to the airport, and I get blown up. And this is what happens. I lose 50% of my blood during the attacks, 50%. I needed three blood transfusions when I reached the hospital the next day, I mean, that day. And the doctors had no idea, they could not understand how I never passed out and I stayed awake the whole time. And on a side note, that was one of the critical points as well. Because when, you, when, when there's a wide catastrophe like this, um, the emergency workers put signs on your body. So a green sign means it's just a scratch. Uh, the, the emergency workers don't have to pay attention to that person. They'll be fine. Yellow one is, okay, starting to get serious. Red is critical, first in the ambulance, first to the hospital. A black one means they're going to die. So you see a 6'9 guy on the cart, passed out, with legs almost torn off. I could have gotten a black one, but I got a red one. I was awake. And so for, for weeks after the attacks, those doctors could not understand how I stayed awake, how that critical point in the whole experience allowed me to survive. And they tested me. They took blood samples. I said, listen, I've lost enough blood. Let's keep some of this blood in me. I said, no, no, we, we don't understand. They tested my supplements. I have my own supplement company now. And I've taken supplements. I'm a big believer in that for a long time. And they tested everything. They took... They tried everything. They threw in a towel. I said, listen, we, you're a freak of nature. We don't understand. Until I told them about the pasta carbonara. And they said, aha, that's the reason why. I was like, wait, it's not because I'm big and tall and strong and everything? That's not it? Because that's going to really change the story. Like, no, no. It's just because of the pasta. I was like, well, we're going to have to work together because I can't use that. It doesn't, doesn't sound as good. And no, no, it's because of the pasta carbonara. You see, your blood sugar index was so high, your glycemic index was so high that you were able to sustain that type of blood loss. The reason you are alive today is because of those three portions of pasta carbonara. So what's the moral of the story? 
never say no to a second portion of pasta carbonara, right? But why am I really alive today? I'm alive today because I have so much quality in my life that I have a friend who loves me enough to call me four times when I hung up on him. I have a friend who cares about me enough and wants to see me enough that does not give up after I hang up on him three times. I'm alive today because of the quality of my life. I'm alive today because I have focused on quality, on experiences, on travel, on people. I urge you today, how many of you have that quality in your life? How many of you focus on the quality every day that you have in your life? On friendship, on tolerance, on open-mindedness. Because the more you focus on the quality of your life, the more your life takes off. It's a very simple equation that not many people focus on. But I don't know of a better example for me to share with you than beating death, of being able to walk again. The more examples life gives me, the more challenges I overcome, the more I see this focus on quality is at the root of all those successes. And so if there's one message I can give you today, focus on the quality of your life and not necessarily the quantity. Because the quality of my life is what saved my life and what allowed me to be here and share this story with you today. I took a lot of heat in the press in, in, in Belgium and Europe by saying that this was, in the end, a gift for me. And what I mean by that is not many people get a chance to rebuild themselves. Not many people get a chance to have their perspective completely changed on life. And when you rebuild yourself, it's like building a, it's like building a house. If you want a three-story house or a two-story house, the foundation is the most important part. It's very hard to, to build a two-story house on a very weak foundation. It's going to crumble. So when you rebuild yourself, when, you get, when life gives you a chance to rebuild yourself, well, you want to rebuild yourself on the most positives, the, the brick and mortar. You want that to be pretty solid. And I never saw, I'm, I'm, getting, to your, I'm, I'm getting to your question, sorry. I'm taking the long route. Um, you, never, you, you don't want to rebuild yourself on, on hatred, on revenge, on, on fear. Those are things that, in my opinion, aren't solid. And so I, I quickly made a decision early on. I said, this is, this is going to be a big rebuilding process. This is going to be something that's going to take a while. It's going to take a lot of energy. I'm going to maximize that approach. And so what I did was I really made a conscious effort to say, okay, the exact opposite of those emotions, I, they serve no purpose. They're going to sap all this energy that I need from, the true, from, the, from, the, from my true goal. And, and you, find that, you find that in many aspects of life. I, I see that, for example, with labels. A, a, a lot of us put labels on things. And it actually handicaps us. For example, if you, if you, if you meet somebody, and I, don't worry, I'm not going to get political, but if you meet somebody and say, listen, I'm a Democrat and you're a Republican, by putting a label on someone, you immediately create a divide. If that's the first thing you focus on, you create a divide. There's a difference between So you're going to have to spend more energy in meeting each other halfway. But if the first thing you do, without any fear, revenge, or hatred, you, see, you meet the person as just another human being, well, you've already made a connection. Hi, I'm so-and-so. I'm a human being. Hi, I'm also a so-and-so, and I'm a human being. Well, you're connected. You're the same thing. Instead, if you approach somebody by saying, hi, I'm this, oh, I'm that, well, there's a divide. Now, you may be able to get over the divide, but it's going to be an uphill battle because you're starting handicapped. On top of that, go add hatred, 
revenge, fear. Well, you're, you're really handicapping yourself. Remember those baggage. Remember that baggage I talked about. You want to pack all the quality you want. That's what makes your life easier. That's what makes your life more smooth. And so to answer your question, it really is, there's no room for that in my luggage because it handicaps me. I got a chance to rebuild myself. I got a chance to kind of start over and do it even better. Hopefully it's better. Time will tell. (laughs) But I'm going to rebuild myself with all these positives, this new perspective, and this new approach, which has no room for hatred, revenge, and all those things. Thank you.